Oh my God. Oh, what a day. Downhill bike shootouts. Who doesn't love those? If you guys remember last year, I claimed that the Canyon Sender CFR was my favorite downhill bike. I, I absolutely love this bike. After getting the new Trek Session 9, that thing really started to feel incredibly fast, super confident on the trail, and so we dusted this thing off and put the bikes head to head, all of our testers on a number of different terrain and trails from jump lines to super steep downhills to a little bit flatter, mellower downhill trails. And we are excited to report back on some really interesting findings on these two top shelf downhill bikes. So first up, a bike that doesn't need much introduction if you've watched our bike park review tour or our long-term review of this bike, the Canyon Sender CFR. It is a size large, carbon fiber, top of the line offering from Canyon, uh, 29 inch wheeled spec, retails for $5,799. The Challenger here in the blue corner is the new Trek Session 9 a bike that we've been on for the better part of this year. It is a size R2. Trek has gone to a reach specific sizing and it is a aluminum frame, $6,999. Let's get into comparing the bikes and talk about some of the similarities. Both are very specific purpose-built downhill race machines. 29 inch wheels front and rear. The Trek can be run in a mullet or full 27.5 inch wheel platform with some adjustability, uh, some headset cups to run 27.5 up front. If you just want to do a mullet, you can switch a couple of chips in the back end, you're good to go. The size large and up Canyon senders are fixed at that 29 inch wheel position. The size small and mediums do come with a mullet, however. Similarities continue with suspension products and drivetrain. We've got RockShox and SRAM products on both of these bikes. RockShox Ultimate, Super Deluxe Rear Shocks, um, X01 7 speed DH drivetrains, and Code RSC brakes. Uh, speaking of the brakes, something that we do have a bit of an issue with is the spec of 180 millimeter rear rotor on the session. We actually reached out to Trek and asked are the World Cup downhill guys on the Trek factory team running a 180 brake on their sessions? It, it just seemed like an odd choice. Uh, it sounds like moving forward into the future, we might be seeing a 200 or larger rotor on the back of these sessions, which is a good call in our opinion. Next, we'll move into the two bikes geometries. This is where you start kind of seeing the bikes pull apart in their sizing and uh, maybe rider preference. We opted to go with the R2, which is in the middle, or it would be close to, I guess, a medium, you could say, in the Trek lineup. Trek also has a bigger size, the R3, which I believe is a 495 reach, and that's just too long for our preference and our riding style. We're about 5'11 to 6'6'1 six six um, on our test team, and we just aren't fans of these super long bikes, and so we opted for that 465. Chainstay length on this bike is 445 millimeters and it comes with a 63 degree head tube angle. And you do have some minor adjustments. If you slide the forks up and down in the crowns, you can um, also change the suspension progression from 20% to 25%, depending on your terrain and riding style. But 445 chainstay, 63 degree head tube angle and 465 reach are the key numbers there. Our size large sender is 485 millimeters in reach. It's about five mil longer than we would like, but their medium was a little just too small. Also, the Canyon has three headset positions where you can lengthen or shorten that reach number by, I believe, six millimeters, which is a really cool feature and something that we took advantage of depending on if we were you know, back on the East Coast or riding West Coast stuff, um, just depending on the terrain. Also, a 63 degree head tube angle 445 chain stays in the long position or 435 in the short position. And we'll get into that um, 10 millimeters shorter rear end uh, shortly. Canyon is still using their MX Link four bar system. Trek's new session obviously is going to a high pivot 
idler equipped um, suspension platform still maintains use of their active braking pivot or AVP system. And uh, based on the height, it, it's, I would say more of a mid high pivot, not a full high pivot. And I think that is really important because you don't suffer a lot of the penalties of a full, like really high pivot bike. And you don't have quite as rearward of an axle path. You don't have quite as much hang up or kick back through the pedals. And I think that was really awesome and uh, probably a smart move. And as you can see by the race results on the World Cup circuit this year, this bike is no slouch when the clock is running. All right, so now we're gonna get into the ride characteristics of both of these bikes. Like I said before, this was, I made a big claim, my favorite downhill bike of all time. Absolutely loved it. Um, I have been a Trek fan. I am a Trek bikes fan. Um, if you've read our older reviews on the Session 9.9s, it is a very stellar machine. It had a couple of little quirks and um, traits that required a lot of shock tuning or the ability to get a special shock uh, from Fox, but those are all squashed on the new bike. The suspension on this thing is absolutely insane. This bike had me wanting to take my hands off the brake levers entirely on sections of trail where I knew I had to brake to make a corner. And my brain was telling me like, you gotta slow down. There's no way you can make this turn. But the bike felt so smooth, so composed over the braking bumps and chatter that I just didn't want to stop the fun and, and use the brakes. But um, it's not all good on the session. There were a couple of sections of trail where we repeatedly had some issues and the sender would take the lead. It would put in faster lap times and it would feel easier to maneuver. Now, some of those situations occurred regularly on a trail called Rockfall, which is one of our favorites at Mount Bachelor. It is a very steep ridge fall line with some rocks, uh, some kind of steep, you know, two to two and a half foot drops into really sharp corners, very tight trees that you would navigate around. And what we noticed is that the, the trek felt long and it felt like you couldn't really break traction on that rear tire very easily. That's why we looked at the wheelbase and so many other numbers on these bikes when doing this review because we could have sworn that this trek was way longer in the rear end, way longer wheelbase, and we're actually surprised to find out in, in some of those measurements is actually shorter at static measurement, right? With that high pivot design as the bike sags into travel and then even further into the suspension when you're weighting it, that rear end and that wheelbase actually lengthens. So coming into some corners where you'd want to kind of weight that back tire to get the front end around, you could feel that back end kind of get longer and not break loose. And I don't want to say hang up, but it just, it just felt longer back behind you. And like, you couldn't just snap the bike around where you wanted it to go. The sender is stiff. It doesn't lengthen. It doesn't really change its wheelbase a ton. And, and it, it's just there. And when you need to just oh dip it, tap a rear brake maybe, and just get that back end out, it will do what you want it to do. So um, that was an instance where the sender had a, uh, an advantage for our riders and our style of riding and terrain and something to take note of if you ride an area that has a lot of slower tighter uh, i don't want to say jankier but like just kind of some slower more awkward trails the the rear end lengthening and that kind of really sticky rear end that doesn't want to break loose could be something that slows you down a touch now when we got out onto the high speed stuff, when we were plowing down tree roots and rocks and anything, downed riders, you name it, this thing would just eat it up. It was plowing over everything. The pedal feedback was minimal. I mean, it was just such a confident and stable machine that we were all having an absolute blast on it. Same goes for jump trails. Um, the bike was a lot of fun. It, it did just fine for the size of jumps that we like to hit. Um, you know, obviously the Trek guys weren't running this bike at, you know, Rampage and maybe other free ride events because of that lengthening rear end and they like those session park setups a little better. But um, if you're just an all around downhiller, 
you want a bike that primarily focuses on on the race aspect and going fast and smoothing out the trail but you still want to hit the jump line and you know hit up a line and dirt merchant while you're in whistler this bike will absolutely do that and and have a great time doing it but it is most definitely built for new school high speed fast rough and chunky downhill tracks now the sender um, Again, I don't want to keep going into how rad this bike is. We've made a couple of videos on that. It rules. There is a reason that I've ignored Canyon's emails when they keep asking me to send this thing back. Um, sorry, guys. I absolutely love this bike. It is one of the favorite bikes I've ridden in 10 plus years of, of testing bikes, and it is absolutely insanely versatile. But as I rode the session more, I really started to like some of the things it did, some of the places it picked up speed. I liked how it smoothed stuff out. And Sour Patch was the exact opposite. He was sold that the session was so much faster, so much better than the sender. Ends up maybe we didn't quite do enough suspension tuning for him to get this thing just dialed in. The uh, recent baby has added a few pounds of weight on me here. So we let out a couple PSI of the suspension for Sour Patch and Nick as well. And all of a sudden they went back and forth again. And Sean absolutely fell in love with the sender once again and was like, dude, I don't know. This thing might be even more fun than the session. So um, long story short, we did timed runs. Uh, we did jump line runs. We did just body feel and input runs. And these two bikes are nearly neck and neck. I mean, we were within at the greatest differential, maybe two seconds, which I know in World Cup racing is massive, right? But to your average consumer, is two seconds really that big of a deal? Could you mess up your own riding on the same bike and have a two second spread? Most likely so. I was almost neck and neck. I had multiple splits, multiple top to bottom runs where I was under a second uh, in, in difference on both of these bikes. One would be faster in a certain split, one would be faster in another split, and it really boiled down to where I ride more and which bike I would rather have. Another area that it really boils down to is value. Um, and I don't even wanna talk about frame material because to me, frame material is not important. Uh, a, a better value analysis, I guess, to me would be how good is that frame made? Um, you could have a crappy carbon frame and a really good aluminum frame, and I'd pick the aluminum frame, right? And I think these brands both do their materials well. Uh, this aluminum frame is absolutely awesome, and it wouldn't stop me from considering that bike at all. The Carbon Sender, also a great bike, great material. Um, they make an aluminum one, and I would probably be just as happy riding that if it had the same spec and components on it. So. What I am talking about for value though, is that this bike, even in carbon, is $57.99. This bike in aluminum is $69.99. So to many consumers, the perceived value of getting carbon versus alloy, you know, it's gonna be hard to argue against that. To me, a good bike is a good bike, but when you've got nearly identical specs, and in fact, you've probably even got more in-house you know, Bontrager branded components, which I think would bring value and price down because you're using in-house components compared to, you know, DT Swiss, um, you know, more third-party components that are found on the sender. Uh, it starts getting tough to be like, is this bike a thousand dollars better than this bike? And even if they were the same price, which bike is a better bike? Um, and that's kind of where we really wanted to dig in deep on this review. Both of these bikes, like I said, this, the clock doesn't lie for our riding and our testing. They're on the money, on the trail feel for both bikes, phenomenal. They're absolutely, I we would be stoked to have or own either one of these bikes. I think depending on, on your terrain and your riding style, you may like the stability the length, the planted feel of this bike. If you spend a lot of time in really tight, slower, you know, navigating around obstacles, maybe slightly flatter stuff. The Sender is also, it it rides a little bit lighter. The weight difference is not huge. Uh, it's two pounds, which is pretty notable, 34.7 pounds. 
and 36.6 pounds. But this bike gets off the ground really nicely. Not to say this doesn't, um, but if you see a little root, a little rock, and you just want to gap something or pre-hop a, a, a drop to come in and break a bit earlier, this thing just absolutely floats and it goes over stuff so well. The upside to this bike is plowing over stuff at high speed, um, letting off the brakes and just going mock speed over the gnarly stuff. This bike might have a slight advantage, but again, to really boil it down, does it do it $1,000 or $1,200 better than this bike? I don't think it does. Um, and this bike doesn't really suffer any of the drawbacks in awkward scenarios or trail conditions that this bike does. So price, value, all around ride quality, maybe even looks might go to that sender. These guys couldn't have made it any more difficult for us. We, have, we give massive applause to both Trek and Canyon's engineering team. There are racers out on the front lines that are working hard to make these bikes as good and fast as possible. Thank you guys very much for watching. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. You might not be subscribed. Hit this button, it would mean a lot to us. We would greatly appreciate it. Thank you again for watching and we hope to see you guys next season out at the bike parks. Until next time.